In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on favorably reporting H.R. 1695 as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, uh, chair recognize Mr. Palmer. Uh, recorded vote is ordered. As previously announced, further proceedings on the question will be postponed. Uh, our next item for consideration is H.R. 1209, Fair and Open Competition Act. The clerk will please report the bill. H.R. 1209, Fair and Open Competition, FOCA Act, a bill to preserve open competition and federal government neutrality towards the labor relations of federal government contractors on federal and federally funded construction projects and for other purposes. Without objection, the bill should be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. The chair recognizes himself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will please report the amendment. An amendment in the nature of a substitute offered to H.R. 1209 as offered by Mr. Comer of Kentucky. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read and the substitute will be considered as original text for the purposes of further amendment. I recognize myself for five minutes for a statement on the bill and the amendment. I'm pleased to call up my bill, H.R. 1209, the Fair and Open Competition Act. As our nation continues to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and as tax dollars are used to fund infrastructure projects across the land, one thing should be clear. Every construction worker in every state should have a fair chance to work on any construction project funded by American tax dollars. That, however, is not what President Biden wants. On February 4th, 2022, President Biden issued Executive Order 14063 entitled, Use of Project Labor Agreements for Federal Construction Projects. That executive order required federal contracting agencies to mandate project labor agreements, also known as PLAs, on federal construction projects worth $35 million or more. Project labor agreements are, in layperson's terms, requirements to use only union workers for a project. President Biden further instructed the Federal Acquisition Regulation Council to implement his order in the Code of Federal Regulations. That new regulation is currently in its final stages of review. If it goes into effect, it will be harder for a future president to reverse President Biden's policy. But that policy, put simply, is not a fair deal for the American construction workforce. Biden's regulation will raise taxpayer costs and prevent non-union workers from working on federal projects. It will even force right-to-work states to freeze local workers out of cooperative federal projects. In fact, over 80% of the U.S. construction workforce would be frozen out of federal projects because over 80% of construction workers do not belong to a union. Congress kept these requirements out of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Congress should act again to overturn President Biden's order and prevent the federal government from discriminating against contractors based on labor affiliation. That's why I introduced the Fair and Open Competition Act. Unlike President Biden's order, my bill maintains federal neutrality on project labor agreements. It neither mandates nor prevents them. It simply allows individual agencies, contractors, and subcontractors to decide project by project what is best for each given circumstance. This approach is fair, and it respects the diverse needs of a vast and diverse nation. H.R. 1209 is an even-handed position all committee members should be willing to support. The bill is supported by a host of business groups representing millions of workers. It's also supported by a broad range of taxpayer advocate groups, all of whom have the interests of federal taxpayers in mind. I urge my colleagues to support this bill. I now recognize the ranking member for his statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, alas, I have to strongly oppose this bill, which would prevent the federal government from using one of the very best tools we've got to ensure that large construction projects are completed effectively, efficiently, and safely. Um, people are attempting to paint H.R. 1209 as a bill about instilling fairness and neutrality, 
Um, but the process is already fair and neutral. Federal construction projects are, of course, highly complex, and if they're not managed properly, they can produce expensive delays, unsafe work sites, lengthy disputes, and unethical business practices. And that's why President Biden issued Executive Order 14063 earlier this year. The order requires the use of project labor agreements on federal construction projects above $35 million in value to address these challenges and to ensure that taxpayers are getting the best mileage for their money. President Biden's executive order is estimated to improve the return on investment of 262 billion taxpayer dollars and the working conditions of nearly 200,000 workers on federal construction projects. H.R. 1209 would reverse this progress and prohibit agencies from even considering the use of PLAs in funding construction contracts, even when the PLA would save the taxpayers money. PLAs are an essential tool to permit tr to promote transparency and accountability in federal construction. These pre-hire collective bargaining agreements negotiated between unions and employers lay out the terms and conditions of employment for construction projects. They guard against risk and ensure stability by promoting fairness and transparency in the project, including through compliance with different laws and rules. PLAs help resolve disputes ahead of time. They ensure safer work sites and they avoid work dis disruptions that can cause protracted and expensive delays. A wide range of research demonstrates that PLAs are effective tools to ensure the stewardship of taxpayer dollars by controlling costs, enhancing efficiency, ensuring safe and equitable working conditions, and benefiting the local community. They increase budget accuracy, ensure that skilled workers are available for the whole duration of the project, and they protect against disruption and delay. Contrary to my colleagues' repeated claims, non-union contractors are perfectly free to bid on projects that require PLAs. Workers covered under a PLA are not required to join a union to work on the project, and PLAs are legal even in right-to-work states. All that they do is to lift the floor up to increase the fairness and the efficiency of the work site generally. The markup of this anti-transparency legislation follows a series of letters from committee Republicans to leaders at the OMB, which make outlandish and inaccurate claims about project labor agreements, including that they reduce competition in value for taxpayers and limit opportunities for communities. In fact, PLAs protect taxpayers from the inevitable race to the bottom that incentivizes that incentivizes contractors to underpay and undertrain their workers, cut corners that threaten project integrity, and bring in cheaper outside labor instead of providing high-quality jobs locally to the community. PLAs are public documents that anyone can review for their fairness and their soundness. If my Republican colleagues have identified specific concerns with any of them, I invite them to identify those concerns publicly. But absent any specific unbiased evidence, we're left to conclude that H.R. 1209 and other attacks on PLAs are simply another example of the determination to erode transparency and accountability protections for the public, to, underline, to undermine labor movements, and to put special interest profits before the well-being of workers. I urge my colleagues all to oppose this unnecessary bill, and I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Kimberly yields back. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following documents. A letter to this committee in support of FOCA from the Associated General Contractors of America. A letter to this committee in support of the bill from the Associated Builders and Contractors. A coalition letter to this committee in support of the bill from a diverse group of 25 construction and business associations. A letter to this committee in support of the bill from the Independent Electrical Contractors and a letter to this committee in support of the bill from the National Taxpayers Union. Without objection, so ordered. Do any other members wish to be heard? Mr. Chairman? Cha chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, for five minutes. Well, I thank uh, the chairman and the committee uh, for marking up this legislation. And unlike so much legislation in Congress, the name of this bill actually accurately describes what it does, which is ensures that merit shop contractors who employ 88 88 percent, so that's 12 percent otherwise, 88 percent of the construction workforce which can fairly compete for federally, federal and federally funded construction projects. Government mandated 
So the government requires it. That's freedom in America. Government mandated project labor agreements simply drive up the cost of federal projects. Uh, and look, the, the, the amount that it's driving it up is a matter of conjecture. I know for certain in Pennsylvania where contracts were bid without the agreement and then bid with the agreement, the cost was anywhere from 6 to 15 percent, but some estimate up to 20 percent, an increase uh, through the prevention of competition combined with inefficient work rules required under the PLA. Now, let me be clear. I got no beef with private unions and private contractors that are unionized. I got no beef whatsoever. This is an issue of fairness across the board. Whatever standard we set should be set for everyone, not one standard for some and another standard for others. This is America. We should have one standard and all should adhere to that standard. We should not be doing things as a federal government that inherently increase the cost to the people paying the bill, which are the taxpayers. And that's what PLAs do. PLAs are there to ensure a certain sector of the workforce, the 12 percent sector, have a carve out, a set aside, have a leg up, have a different standard than the 88 percent who do not. That's why they're there. This is a special interest. This is exactly what this is. It is a special interest. And this bill seeks to end that special interest so that the taxpayers who we support, who we work for, who are our bosses, they're our special interest. They should be our special interest. We should be supporting them. And that's what this bill seeks to do. I, I marvel at... Uh, uh, my friend, the gentleman from Maryland, and the claims made that this actually saves money. I don't know other members of the body that have been contractors, but I have been one. And contracts, pretty simple. I agree to do this work by this amount of time to this standard, and you agree to pay. That's it. We don't need a special contract that says, I'm not going to strike. But that's what this is. That's, that's the safety net. That's included in PLAs. Well, I, I won't strike as long as we have this signed and I, and I get to do this work under a special agreement that no one else gets to participate in. Ladies and gentlemen, we expect people not to strike as long as they're being paid for doing the job correctly. That's the contractual relationship. I sign a contract. I say, I'm going to do the work at this time to this standard, and you're going to pay me for it. Well, I don't expect you to strike. If you're being paid and you're doing the work appropriately, I don't expect you to strike if you don't get your way on some kind of negotiation. The federal government is contracting you to do the work. You agreed to it. Here are the specifications. Here are the plans. You understood what you're in, getting into, and that's why, you, that's why you bid on the project. Ladies and gentlemen, 88% of the construction force is in the merit shop business. Merit Shop, that's who's doing 88% of the work. This bill seeks to make it fair across the board for the not only 88%, but the 12%. Again, I have no beef at all with private sector unions in the contracting business. And there are contractors, there are bosses that would abuse their employees and have abused their employees. There's a thing called the National Labor Relations Board that can deal with people that violate. But what we shouldn't do is have one rule that punishes everybody for the sake of the few bad actors. The few bad actors should be punished and punished resoundingly and appropriately. But what we shouldn't do is punish every single American who gets up every morning early, maybe misses their kids getting off to school, packs their lunchbox and goes to work to pay their taxes so a few folks can have a special deal. This bill would solve that. I, uh, I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield the balance, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Do any other members wish to be heard? Chair recognizes uh, uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to associate myself with the remarks of the ranking member. Uh, I'll start off by saying I was an iron worker for about 20 years, a union iron worker. Uh, so I've, I've worked under PLAs in the past. Uh, there have been instances where non-union contractors have been successful in, in getting work on, on uh, PLA projects. 
Um, but I, I, would, I would say that uh, a great majority of the contracts are uh, won by union firms. And I've worked all over the country. Uh, I've worked on uh, projects in Louisiana, New Mexico, New York, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, and, and Illinois, Ohio. Uh, and so I, I've seen how this has worked across the country. Um, one of the great benefits of, of uh, PLAs is the predictability that it offers on a major construction project. And uh, that, that predictability is, is rare in an industry where every project is new and different. So uh, the challenges of, of you know, building a major construction project in an area of the country that in, in a, an environment that is exposed to the weather, quite unpredictable, uh, oftentimes uh, construction firms don't have a, a fixed uh, uh, workforce capable of handling these large projects, so they rely on apprenticeship programs that are run by, jointly by uh, Taft-Hartley entities involving both contractor and union. So they're guaranteed, under this PLA, they're guaranteed there's a steady flow of skilled workers, men and women, men and women who reflect the demographic of that area and reflect the diversity of the cities in which many of these projects are going on uh, in order to complete that project on time and on budget. Those are, those are very valuable uh, uh, factors in terms of trying to meet the obligations that we have to, to taxpayers and also the, the, the entities that are uh, the, the end user of, of these facilities. Uh, one other, uh, I just want to just comment on the, the previous gentleman's comments. Much of the disputes on these projects are between contractors. It's not between the union and the, the contractor. It's between the general contractor and the subcontractor. And because many of the complexities of these projects are unforeseen and they're not, not addressed in the, uh, in the original contract, it ends up in, in endless disputes uh, that end up in court. And one of the things that the PLA does is it requires everybody to perform. It, it requires all the workers to show up every single day, no work stoppages, as the gentleman mentioned. But it also, it also requires the contractor, the subcontractor, to perform. You cannot stop this project from going forward. It needs to meet its deadline. And so regardless of the uh, differences you may have in how the wording of the language, uh, the language of the contract is, you must continue to work on the project, and you can arbitrate your disputes, but the project must go on. And uh, the workers benefit by having you know, a predictable pay level, although it's fixed. I've seen PLAs that the, the owner, uh, in one case uh, Harvard University, that had a multi-billion uh, uh, building project, they said, we want a discount. We want a discount because we're giving all this work for several buildings over several years. We want a discount on what the prevailing wage is out there uh, in the area. And they got it in return for the steady work that was, was, uh, was available. So uh, there, are, there are many benefits that flow from this. Uh, dignity of work and respect for, for workers is, is, is paramount. Uh, I see that. Will the gentleman yield? <laughs> I will. Yield for a question. Uh, because of your expertise in uh, labor law, Mr. Lynch, I wanted to ask you what you make of the suggestion that rather than have a project labor agreement where um, there would be presumably no strike clause, there are fair wages paid to everybody, whether they're union or non union workers who participate, why not instead just say, well, let's let the National Labor Relations Act figure it out? How effective has that been? for workers, I know that the remedy under the NLRA, if somebody gets fired for, say, organizing a union, um, is you spend a year, two years, three years before the NLRB, uh, which is a famously cumbersome and dysfunctional body, and then at the very best you get reinstated. Um, that's not much of a punishment. How well does that work? Uh, with four seconds, my contractor community and labor community would both be horrified by that prospect. That That's... That's, that would take years and years and years and would not satisfy uh, either the contractors or, or the people working out of them. Thank you. My Chair, time has expired. Uh, gentleman, time has expired. Chair, now recognize Mr. Conley for five minutes. 
I thank the chair. And I, uh, I listen with great interest to our friend from Pennsylvania says, well, he had experience as a contractor and uh, he has nothing against unions, but uh, we ought not to be giving them special favors. Maybe we should step back. By the way, I have experience as somebody who contracted with a multi-billion dollar project, the Silver Line, here in Northern Virginia. A line that otherwise took 62 years to complete from the idea being proper, uh, proffered in 1962, when we built Dulles Airport, the premier international airport of the nation's capital, till we finally cut the ribbon this year for phase two. Phase one was on time and largely on budget. You know why? Because it was a PLA. I insisted on it as chairman of Fairfax County. And that PLA worked. It was efficient. It guaranteed timelines. And both contractors and workers, as well as the client, were more than satisfied with the product. Phase two, under a Republican governor and a Republican secretary of labor in the state of Virginia who are hostile to labor, which seems to infuse a lot that's behind this, was not a PLA. In fact, they insisted it could not be a PLA or threaten the funding of phase two. And phase two was three years delayed. Tens of millions of additional costs. Substandard work product and even material that required retrofitting brand new stations that have been constructed because of inferior material from the contractor. <clears throat> so my experience is the opposite of Mr. Perry's. PLAs work and legalizing their non-use, mandating their non-use, is fraught with problems. Let's remember the genesis of PLAs. PLAs were a wartime product to guarantee labor uh, peace during the largest industrial production buildup in human history in World War II here in the United States. It worked. In less than four years, the United States of America, using PLAs liberally in every industry, built more ships, more airplanes, more munitions, more aircraft than had ever been produced in human history, and turned the tide of battle and defeated Nazi Germany and imperialist Japan. That's one heck of a, tr a track record. So PLAs are not some narrow special interest provision. They are, in fact, a very nimble and efficient and proven tool to, to proceed with large projects on schedule, on budget, with qualified labor, working with management. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent at this point to enter into the record a statement opposing this bill by the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association and an evaluation uh, quantifying the value of union labor and construction projects prepared for the Mechanical Industry Advancement Fund. Without objection, so ordered. I thank the chair and I yield. The, oh, I, I'm sorry, I would yield to the ranking member. Thank you kindly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to uh, request unanimous consent to introduce a, a letter from our friends at the North America's Building Trades Union, uh, the NABTU, uh, in opposition to H.R. 1209. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Do any other members wish to be heard? Chair, recognize Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, when I was mayor of, Cal of uh, Long Beach, California, uh, was really proud to have established um, the first citywide project labor agreement um, in the state. So it was not just project specific, but any public project uh, in our city actually went through a project labor agreement process. Um, and other cities since then have adopted that in, in California. And, and we know that project labor agreements, not just in, our, in my state, um, but in places across the country have been very successful. They've been around for decades and critical to a good workforce. Uh, we know they've been used from everything, not just in major construction projects, but also in our schools, our universities, transportation, green energy. Um, and they've been a key component to both public and private sector uh, jobs as well. 
uh, this has been uh, a huge boon for the economy back in California and certainly back home uh, in my city. Uh, we know that this policy has been good for working families and also makes financial sense. Um, it's really, really important to note also there's been a lot of discussion about the supply chain over the last uh, couple of years and around strengthening ports. Um, of which bring in cargo in and out, of course, uh, across the United States. Most of port construction that is happening on the West Coast and, and much on, on the East Coast are under these project labor agreements, specifically so that these important large infrastructure projects actually aren't, don't stop, that there's a clean process, and that they move forward to not interrupt the supply chain. So the impact to the economy and to America's ports around project labor agreements is critically important. When Republicans attack project labor agreements, it's not just an attack on working people. It's an attack on the right to organize. It's an attack on historic investments. And it's a direct attack on our nation's infrastructure. And this bill, of course, doesn't just uh, stop at overturning President Biden's executive order. It would be a, essentially a blanket ban on all project labor agreements where any federal funding is used. And so any project, whether it's federal federal government project, a state or local jurisdiction, or even in the private sector, could see these protections rolled back. It's really, again, an attack on working people. And we also now know that this bill is not just limited to new construction, but any facilities that receive federal funding that are maintained under, pro under a project labor agreement. And we have many of these back home in the city of Long Beach and across the state of California. California, these would also be targeted, threatening even more American jobs. And so if you, even if you don't agree with PLAs or think they're not the best for any certain situation, a vote for this legislation completely eliminates their use for any project that uses federal funding. And that is absolutely outrageous and shameful. It jeopardizes the livelihoods of constituents in every congressional district, opens essential projects up to the possibility of additional costs and delays, and harms our ability to maintain and improve infrastructure that we all depend on. We know that there has been study after study across the country that have concluded that PLAs attract, by the way, the sim a similar number of bidders and have been associated with equivalent or lower costs, oftentimes, than projects without them. So eliminating PLAs across the board for projects with federal funding is really an open attack on working people and the American middle class. And Republicans in this committee and across Congress are pushing for it at a moment when we should literally be doing the opposite. We should be increasing the workforce. We should, we should be creating more local hiring jobs across the country. I, I find it also interesting that Republicans who voted and who have voted against the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and who are now, by the way, praising these projects and going across the country and celebrating these projects back in their district, many of these projects were built with project labor agreements. And so we can go on and on talking about projects across the country that Republicans are now praising that they voted against that were actually project labor agreement projects. And so I want to actually thank President Biden and his leadership for the Infrastructure Reduction Act, for his work on the bipartisan infrastructure agreement, because communities are finally getting the resources that they need. I also want to just add that most project labor agreements have a local hiring component. And what that essentially means is that we're able to not just hire um, from the region or anywhere in the state, but actually from that community. So in California, uh, in my city, we have a percentage where the actual workers need to come directly from the city and the region. So you're ensuring that your local folks actually get these jobs. And so this is ensuring local residents uh, and it's ensuring that projects get built on time um, uh, it, it, across the state and, and, and back home. So for, for us back home, project labor agreements have been a game changer. Above all, it, it, this bill and this really attack it abandons a promise we've made to hardworking men and women across the country. And so I absolutely uh, oppose any efforts to roll back uh, project labor agreements. And with that, uh, I yield back the remainder of my time. Chair recognizes Mr. Palmer from Alabama for five minutes. <clears throat> thank uh, the chairman and um, I thank the chairman for introducing this bill. I'm, I'm not sure what, what bill some of my colleagues are reading because this is not an attack on project labor agreements, just maintains a neutral status and a level playing field uh, for all contractors. And I'd just like to point out that more than 87 percent of U.S. construction workforce chooses not to belong to a union. So you're, you're arguing uh, something, uh, an issue that doesn't exist. I'd also like to point out that uh, the construction industry is facing what has been described as a historic shortage of skilled workers. The Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, projects that we need another 650,000 skilled workers. And what this, uh, the Biden administration's version of the Project Labor Agreement, again, uh, it's going to make that problem even worse. It's going to exacerbate the problem 
by trying to uh, force these people who are in merit shops in, into uh, union shops, uh, further delaying major infrastructure projects that, that we desperately need to get underway. Uh, I just want to point out that a lot of the, the issues that, that we're dealing with with this are, are problems imposed on us by the federal government. And I think what you're trying to do with this bill, which I, I urge my colleagues to, on both sides of the aisle, to reconsider and support, uh, is to, to put us in a position where we can get the workforce that we need, uh, rather than create one impediment after another uh, uh, to getting these people in, in the workforce to get these jobs done. Uh, I, I, I do want to emphasize again that this is neutral toward project labor agreements and uh, it, it allows competition uh, for union shop companies, it allows uh, uh, non-union companies, but the, the key thing that we cannot lose sight of, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. is the need for getting infrastructure projects done. We're, our infrastructure is in decline, uh, uh, particularly on the transportation side. And we do not need uh, another administration uh, imposed uh, impediment to getting the workforce that we need to get these jobs done. With that, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support this, this bill, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Do any other members wish to be heard? Mr. Kassar, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that uh, project labor agreements could discriminate against uh, union versus non-union workers, uh, but my understanding is that federal law guarantees workers the right to choose whether they want to be in a union or not, regardless of a project labor agreement. Mr. Chairman, is that your understanding as well? Are you asking me a question? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I just think that it's important in this bill to make it clear that, in fact, all workers in this country can choose whether to be a, a member of a union or not. And in your laying out of the bill, you said that um, project labor agreements would discriminate against non-union workers. But my understanding is any worker on any project, PLA or not, has a federal right to choose whether to be a part of a union or not. You have a right to be a part of a union, but the, the, the mandate says you have to be a union worker uh, to get the job. Mr. Chairman, it would be good for us to uh, check up on that because I'm pretty sure that you, the project labor agreements do not require you to be a union member to be a part of a job because if it did, then uh, that would be violating your federal right to whether to join a union or not. Again, project labor agreements uh, for everybody to, to lay out is a pre-negotiated set of wages and benefits in order to make sure that we get good workers, train people uh, uh, locally, and then workers can decide whether they want to be a part of a union or not. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, I, I well, hope that would we Would the gentleman yield? Yes, please. Yeah, the, um, the, I thank you for the point. Um, what the project labor agreement does is to uh, agree upon a prevailing wage uh, that union members may have uh, bargained for, but then everybody's got to be paid it. So, uh, but nobody is compelled uh, to join a union that would indeed, as you're saying, Mr. Kassar, violate the National Labor Relations Act, which gives the workers the right to decide whether or not they want to join a union. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. That's yeah. right. Unions have, for example, won us the weekend. And whether you're a union worker or not, you still get the weekend. And so many workers can benefit on project labor agreements while choosing whether or not they want to be a union member. Mr. Chairman, also, as you laid the bill out, you said, uh, and I think I'm quoting this correctly, that there is a host of business groups representing thousands of workers supporting this bill. Uh, there were letters submitted for the bill and against the bill. Of course, those business associations you listed, in fact, represent construction companies, corporations, um, but you said that they represent thousands of workers. Mr. Chairman, did we submitted any letters from organizations supporting the bill that, in fact, are composed of construction workers instead of construction companies? The, these uh, letters represent tens of thousands of construction workers that I think are pretty happy with where they, where they work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My understanding And I don't is believe you're correct in, in your statement, but, but proceed. Would, would the gentleman yield? 
I, I will in one moment because I do want to agree with one of your points, Mr. Palmer, and ask, for, uh, ask you a question if I have the time. Um, my understanding is companies like or associations like the builders and contractors or general contractors represent corporations um, and not their workers, and organizations like SMART uh, and NAB2 represent workers and have elections where workers choose their leadership and choose the agenda. Um, my next question that could go to Mr. Palmer, for example, um, is that these PLAs, we haven't talked that much about the fact that they get us local hiring at the local level and apprenticeship training for workers. And that's a key part of, ad uh, of addressing the worker shortages we see. My question uh, for anybody either in the majority or minority is whether folks know whether the Shawnee Power Plant, the Paradise Power Plant, and the Kentucky Dam that I understand uh, are in Mr. Comer's district or the Department of Energy Uranium Cleanup in Oak Ridge in Mr. Burchett's district or the DOA's Savannah River site in Ms. Mace's district or the Ascend Element Project battery cycling plant being built in Mr. Comer's district or the Black Hills Airport in Ms. Bobert's district or the Intel Chip Plant in Mr. Turner's district or the Resolution Copper Mine in Mr. Big and Mr. Gosar's districts or the Alabama uh, Power Projects in Mr. Palmer's district or the upcoming Honda LG Battery Plant in Mr. Jordan's district or Lambeau Field just outside Mr. Grothman's district or the Toyota pl Power Plant being built or that was built in my district whether those were built successfully under project labor agreements or not. Um, if I may respond to that, again, it's not an issue of project labor agreements. It is this project labor agreement as determined by the Biden administration. And there is a, an issue with uh, uh, training workforce, and I'll give you an example of that, is uh, uh, a federally assisted uh, project here in D.C., the South Capitol Street Corridor P, uh, a phase one project, uh, has the following problem. Uh, language uh, in, in this agreement, Article 13 of Princes, the parties recognize the need to maintain continuing support of programs designed to develop an adequate numbers of competent workers in the construction industry. No disagreement with that. The parties further recognize that apprenticeship and training shall be offered consistent with the applicable union's collective bargaining agreement consistent with the apprenticeship and training programs currently maintained by the Joint Apprentice apprenticeship and training committees sponsored by the unions and their signatory contractors. In other words, if, if your uh, company, a contractor is doing the work, is not union, and they, they, they need to train workers, it has to come from, from the union shop. So again, I just want to make clear that, that what Mr. Comer is trying to do is not eliminate project labor agreements. It is to remain neutral on this. So, th and again, I want to emphasize the shortage of workers. I worked for two international engineering constructions com companies, uh, and we we had uh, uh, union workers in, on certain job sites, but most of our workforce was non-union. We were able to get things done, and what we don't want to do is create more impediments to developing the skilled labor force that we desperately need and getting the infrastructure projects done that we ne desperately need to get done. So don't take this necessarily as anti-union. This is just trying to maintain a new neutral status. And in my opinion, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, the issue really here, here is the dire uh, uh, situation that we face with infrastructure and the need to get more skilled workers on, on the job, whether they're union or non-union, and get these projects completed. And, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. And, and if I may add, I'd just quote this from the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, Non-union workers covered under PLAs may have to pay agency fees to cover costs associated with the duty of unions to fairly represent all workers, union and non-union, in the administration of collective bargaining agreements. So, uh, so, Mr. Chairman, that sounds like I'm correct that non-union workers work on project labor agreements all the time. They may, just like we have well, to do all over the country, just, chip in for representation because we don't want free riders and free loading. Um, and I actually associate myself entirely with Mr. Palmer's remarks that we need good apprenticeship programs. And these are oftentimes managed both by contractors and unions alike. And the free loading problem that we've started to find in the construction industry is that oftentimes those workers get trained up by unions there may not be enough union work. That training 
those trained workers then go work elsewhere, and there isn't the economic incentive. There's a market failure for that kind of apprenticeship program, and that is part of where I believe the federal government can step in, is when there's a market failure. That's why the federal government and local and state governments pay for schools, because you can't count on any one business to educate everybody in the country. In the same way, uh, we need to make sure that when we are using our federal purchasing power, that we are training the next generation to go into these jobs um, that are so, so critical to our economy. And that's exactly what the Biden administration is doing, is to make sure that some of these projects, and the answer to my earlier question is that all of those projects in Republican districts and then in mine as well, are all project labor agreement projects, are training the workforce of the future for the infrastructure projects of the future. We should be encouraging project labor agreements because on projects like Naval Base Kitsap in 2015, a multi-billion dollar project, it didn't go over budget. It went $250 million under budget. Most of our home construction projects go over budget, so that's why I'll be opposing this bill. Well, uh, again, um, I just want to make this point that 87% of your workforce is, is non-union in the construction trades, and they do an excellent job in, in those uh, companies in training uh, the workforce, having worked in engineering and, and been involved in some major construction projects. I've seen that firsthand. So I just want to emphasize again that, in my opinion, you're arguing against a position uh, that, that harms our ability to, to, to train our workforce, to get more people into that workforce, and to get these jobs done. Uh, but I understand your position on the issue uh, and, and the position you're going to take on the bill, but I encourage my colleagues to reconsider this and to support this bill because it makes sense. I, I, I understand it, and I appreciate the conversation back and forth, Mr. Chairman, to clear up that this does not discriminate between union and non-union workers. Um, and Mr. Palmer's reading of the Project Labor Agreement language that, while we may disagree, I think actually so, I think what you read out actually solves the problem you're describing. I, I'm, I still don't understand how a project labor agreement, having people jointly chip in for a state-of-the-art training program, hurts workforce development. What you read, I think, actually shows exactly why project labor agreements are what we need to address the construction worker shortages of the future. So I think we need that kind of article and many more construction contracts if we want to solve that it problem. It actually forces the contractors to, to uh, let the union apprentice shops do the training rather than their own shops, which they've invested heavily in. Over and again, yeah, my having, understanding is overwhelmingly, and if you go talk to uh, the Samsungs of the world, the Toyotas of the world, the Hondas of the world, they are showing up and saying, let's set up joint union and contractor training programs where we both chip in. Forced is another word for contract, where we all agree and say, Let's jointly chip in, not just one side or the other, so that we all have skin in the game. And that's what actually gets people trained. So if I don't think works. it's forcing. It's, it's, it's saying, hey, we all agree to do the best thing possible. I, I, we're having an excellent I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Gary gonna, Palmer conclude, then we'll move on to the next. And I, I'll end with this, is that if this is the right thing to do, it will, it will happen. You do not need the government to force it. And again, having worked in that industry, what we try to do is develop best practices, and if this is a best practice, it'll happen. I yield back. Uh, well, in Texas, uh, we have a construction worker die every two and a half days on the job, so not everything happens right on its own. Uh, time's expired. Any other member wish to be recognized? Mr. Chairman, may I be heard? Mr. Goldman. Uh, I would just like to reemphasize the point that uh, my colleagues from Texas and Maryland have made that I think is, is – uh, really the important issue here, which is prevailing wage. That is what these project labor agreements are guaranteeing. And if you don't have a prevailing wage, what you find is the opportunity to abuse a, uh, a, the workers and to, uh, it becomes a race to the bottom to find the lowest cost worker to do the job. That means that you get worse uh, quality of work, you have fewer protections for the workers, and of course, it also means that the corporations make a disproportionate amount of the money available but to be split between the corporations and the workers. Unions and prevailing wage has been principally responsible 
for expanding the middle class in this country. That is what many strive for in order to be able to support their family, to have a uh, home ownership, and to be able to live uh, their American dream. And by eliminating a prevailing wage, what you are essentially doing is eliminating the opportunity for many to achieve their goal of uh, becoming a productive middle class citizens in this country. And so we can debate whether it's a union or non-union, but the point here and the point of these project labor agreements is to guarantee a certain standard of work and a certain wage for those who are working in order to uh, ensure that there's quality of work, some worker protections, and an expansion of the middle class. And I don't know, uh, Mr. Kassar, if you would like any, me to yield any more time. Um, apparently he doesn't, so I will yield back to uh, the chairman. Gentleman yields back to any other members wish to be heard. The question is now on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on favorably reporting H.R. 1209 as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, chair recognizes Mr. Palmer. A recorded vote is ordered as previously announced. Further proceedings on the question will be postponed. Now we're going to do the big one. Okay. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 192 to prohibit individuals who are not citizens of the United States from voting in elections in the District of Columbia. The clerk will please report the bill. H.R. 192, a bill to prohibit an individual who is not a U.S. citizen from voting in any election in the District of Columbia. Without objection, the bill should be considered as read and open for an amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered, the chair recognizes himself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will please report the amendment. An amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 192, as offered by Mr. Comer of Kentucky. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the substitute will be considered as original text for the purposes of further amendment. I now recognize myself for five minutes for a statement on the bill and the amendment. Since the voters entrusted Republicans with control of the House, this committee has conducted long overdue oversight of our nation's capital city by, convincing, by convening three hearings on the District of Columbia. Our most recent D.C. hearing, held jointly with the Committee on House Administration, examined the topic of election integrity in the district. On November 21, 2022, the district government enacted the Local Resident Voting Rights Amendment Act, allowing non-citizen residents to vote in D.C. local elections. This includes illegal immigrants and even foreign diplomats whose interests may be opposed to the interests of Americans.